Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the second episode in our video series. My name is Matt Ahanri, and I'm the policy analyst for the Fund for Railway Accidents Involving Designated Goods. In our first episode, we met with the Honorable Lisa Raitt, the former transport minister, as she recounted her first weeks dealing with the tragic Lac-Mégantic railway accident in 2013. This catastrophic event resulted in the deaths of 47 people, the destruction of the Lac-Mégantic downtown area, the release of about 6 million litres of crude oil, and the evacuation of 2,000 people. As a result, close to 4,300 claims were submitted, representing $1.5 billion in damages caused by this incident. We also discussed the laws that she introduced to Parliament to better prepare and prevent similar accidents in the future. Accountability and liability measures were improved to support Canadians in the event of a major railway accident involving crude oil. All of this led to the creation of the fund in 2016. Today, we'll be exploring the reasons why these changes happened and how these changes were made. The director of the fund, Dan DeToda, will meet with three railway experts. Our first panelist is Luc Chamberlain from the Canadian Transportation Agency. Mr. Champerlin serves as Director of Rail and Marine Group, which monitors the Certificate of Fitness of various railway operators in Canada at the federal level, and monitors the appropriate third-party liability coverages of these operators. Luc also has 20 years of experience at Transport Canada in various leadership and management roles, including as Regional Director of Rail Safety and Transportation of Dangerous Goods. Our second panelist, Donald Grussel, is President and CEO of Roussel Strategic Advisory Service. Mr. Roussel was a founding member of the IMC International Council and in 2014 was appointed the Associate Assistant Deputy Minister of Safety and Security at Transport Canada. In January 2018, Donald was assigned as Senior Advisor to the Assistant Deputy Minister for Safety and Security, reporting to the Deputy Minister of Transport Canada. Our third panelist, Andy Ash, is the Director of Dangerous Goods at the Railway Association of Canada. Mr. Ash is a certified railway car inspector and tank car specialist and has been with the RAC for over 20 years. He represents railway interests in the transportation of dangerous goods in North America. Andy has responded to thousands of incidents involving dangerous goods and has produced and delivered many training courses involving various aspects of the transportation of dangerous goods. Let's begin. Dan, take it away. Gentlemen, welcome. We are glad to have you with us today. I'd like to start the conversation by getting a sense of what your immediate reactions were to the lac Meganic derailment. When news about the accident first began to spread, what were some of your thoughts as the incident continued to develop? And what were some of the reactions within your organizations? Well, I can start and uh, our thought were with the family affected by this terrible event. And of course, our own staff in the Rail Safety and Transportation of Dangerous Goods program in particular. It was a life-changing accident for so many people. This being said, the whole of Government Incident Command uh, needed to be deployed, for example, the Sitsen of Transport Canada, but also the federal level, the Federal Emergency Management Response Program, which is called FERP, at the government of Canada level. Uh, in particular, we deploy our national aerial surveillance plane on site and over the entire area from Lac Megantic to the St. Lawrence River in support of all response organizations, both locally, but uh, at the provincial levels and at the Canadian level uh, with regard to the situational awareness and information sharing. Thank you. Luke? Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, you know, similarly to Donal, I mean, my thoughts were with the families who were directly affected by this catastrophic accident and the entire town of Lac Megantic. As you know, uh, their car downtown was leveled and uh, there were oil tank cars burning for several days. Uh, I was with Transport Canada at the time, and this uh, did shake our organization, obviously. Uh, as a group of public servants dedicated to protecting public safety, such events inevitably affect us deeply. Um, at the time, we wanted to know how this could have happened, given that there are several safety layers in place to prevent such accidents. Absolutely. Andy? 
Well, as emergency responders, uh, we on the RAC uh, DG team uh, were mobilized almost immediately after the accident happened. Uh, we were on site in approximately four hours to assist uh, in response and to work with the uh, the local fire department of Lac Mechanic and the railway in a unified command system response. And we continued our work on site for 15 days until the last of the dangerous goods was removed from the tank cars. The Lac Mechanic accident led to major changes to the railway industry in Canada. In your respective fields, what have been some of the most significant outcomes of the derailment? Um, like I believe that the public safety net uh, for the movement of dangerous goods by rail and more specifically the movement of crude oil has been significantly uh, you know uh, strengthened uh, including the creation of the fund that was celebrating the five-year anniversary now uh, which added another layer of protection in the event of uh, an accident happening uh, the canadian transportation agency issues certificate of fitness to railway companies in canada and we establish a robust annual compliance monitoring exercise that requires freight railways to update their level of dangerous good transported, including crude oil and, and toxic inhalation hazards, and certify the renewal of their liability insurance coverage in accordance with the requirements of the Canada Transportation Act. And of course, I would say collectively as regulators, <coughs> operators, industry associations, shippers and municipalities, we must remain vigilant to identify and mitigate emerging risks and constantly work at improving our safety culture. Uh, yes, I can add that uh, we certainly need to highlight the, the significant changes to multiple act and regulations, and in particular, the Railway Safety Act, the Transportation of Danger, Dangerous Good Act, and the Canadian Transportation Act. So the Railway Operating Certificate Regulation is certainly one of the major changes for the industry, which was not present before. Uh, plus, of course, the adjustment to the fund and all the other uh, level of uh, certifications needed now to uh, to be able to move those dangerous goods. Um, Andy, can you can you add something? Certainly, Th there were there were various emergency orders from Transport Canada that took effect very quickly after the accident, and then in the months that followed, uh, the railways assisted the uh, Transportation Safety Board in the investigation. And, and then Transport Canada initiated a, an emergency response task force that uh, eventually returned 40 recommendations of regulatory change and railway operational changes. And also uh, through the North American Association of American Railroads Tank Car Committee and its members, we, uh, we developed uh, and implemented a new design of tank car for flammable liquids, and that's commonly known as the DOT or TC-117. And the uh, an implementation schedule was then introduced by Transport Canada. In the Lac Meganic rail accident, about 6 million litres of crude oil was quickly released from the derailed tankers. And we know that the fund for railway accidents involving designated goods was created in response to this derailment. At this time, the fund only covers damages from rail accidents involving crude oil. So Andy, can you tell us more about the characteristics of crude oil and what safety concerns must be considered when transporting it? Well, crude oil has traditionally been thought of as a, a thick black oily substance, where in fact, it can assume many different characteristics from the oil fields to transport, uh, to delivery at the destination. You know, crude can be a dark color to a light bluish viscous substance that can emit flammable vapors. Sour crude is, is a heavy substance like uh, bunker oil or diesel, and uh, light sweet crude may contain uh, a bitumen that can contain butane or propane gases and also can emit toxic vapors such as H2S, hydrogen sulfide. Also, a, a diluent uh, would be added to make the product thinner and easier to load or offload. Let's now move on to the certificate of fitness and liability insurance that, we, that was mentioned just earlier. Before transporting dangerous goods within Canada, railway companies must obtain a certificate of fitness. Luke, could you explain the purpose of this certificate? Uh, if a person wants to construct or operate a freight or passenger railway under federal jurisdiction, they must apply to the Canadian Transportation Agency for a certificate of fitness. This is an obligation. 
Before issuing a certificate of fitness, we must be satisfied that rail freight carriers have the required volume-based liability insurance coverage. There are also insurance requirements that must be met for passenger rail services and for the construction of air railway. So you mentioned liability insurance. Can you tell us what this means? Yes, generally speaking, according to Section 92 of the Canada Transportation Act, real liability insurance must cover third-party bodily injury or death, third-party property damage, and risks associated with a leak, pollution, or contamination. But more specifically, for railway accidents involving designated goods, essentially crude oil at this stage, the coverage is more extensive and includes losses, damages, costs and expenses related to the accident for any person, including the crown or a province. It includes also the loss of non-use value relating to a public resource. Example, drinking water. Uh, Andy, in a minute, we are going to discuss the insurance needed based on volumes of dangerous goods transported. The acronym TIH was used. Can you tell us what this means? Certainly. TIH means Toxic Inhalation Hazard, which is an industrial health and safety warning, and it's also a regulatory description requirement. As I mentioned before, in the case of crude oil, this uh, description would apply to crude with, uh, when there's a presence of hydrogen sulfide. So, Luke, you mentioned that in order to apply for this certificate of fitness, railway companies need to be covered at all times by an insurance for a certain amount. Can you tell us how this amount is determined? Yes, so uh, we'll refer to Schedule 4 of the Canada Transportation Act, and I believe we can show the, the table here, uh, which came into effect in 2016 and has four levels of minimum liability insurance coverage based on the type and volume of dangerous goods. So I'll start with the highest level, level four. So if you have more than 50,000 tons of uh, toxic inhalation hazards on a yearly basis, or more than 1.5 million tons of crude oil, you need to have a minimum of $1 billion of liability insurance per occurrence. Now, if you have less than that, like let's say between 4,000 tons of TIH and 50,000 tons, or between 100,000 tons of crude oil and 1.5 million tons, then your minimum liability insurance coverage is $250 million per occurrence. That's level three. At level two, with $100 million of liability insurance per occurrence, that applies if you have less than 4,000 tons of TIH or less than 100,000 tons of crude oil or more than 40,000 tons of other dangerous goods. Uh, at level one is if you have less than all the other levels. And currently there are no railway operators at level one with only $25 million of liability insurance per occurrence. And we're talking about freight railways here. Uh, CNNCP, just for your information, do carry a very high volume of, of uh, you know, dangerous good and, and crude oil. And they are at the $1 billion per occurrence liability coverage. Okay, so I'd like to highlight what was just said here, so that the insurance levels are based on volumes of crude oil transported yearly and vary between $100 million and $1 billion when designated goods are involved. Do you think this is enough coverage? Um, I do, Dan, uh, and the reason why I do is I think that with the establishment and availability of the compensation fund, uh, if the liability is in excess to the minimum in Schedule 4, you know, depending if you're at 100 million to 50 million or, or 1 billion, then the, the fund does cover that excess liability. So on that premise, yes, I, I think the, the current regime is sufficient. So let's go back in time to shortly after the Lac Meganic accident. Transport Canada has written that the Montreal Main and Atlantic Railway, the company involved in the derailment at Lac Meganic, have highlighted weaknesses in the liability and compensation regime, particularly as it relates to insurance coverage. Donald, can you tell us what these weaknesses were? Yes, certainly. When the industry start moving crude oil in train unit, so complete train instead of car, uh, car part of a convoy, 
And in the case of Lake Megantic, I think it was around 70 car. The business model got a lot closer to what the maritime sectors have been uh, witnesses for decades. So the sectors has been involved for decades with the large volumes and a large multiple facet of liability, both uh, coverage at the domestic level in Canada with the Maritime Liability Fund, but also with the International Fund. So a, re a review of the liability model uh, became relevant following the, the Megantic incident. And this was well explained by Luke on how that model have, has evolved from about $25 million for the like, Megantic company who was operating to now today, a billion dollar. Okay, so I'd like to turn back to Luke. And, and Luke, what measures were changed at the CTA as a result of the LAC Meganic? And could you describe this transition? Thanks, Dan. Uh, based on industry and public consultation, it was clear that we needed to adjust our compliance monitoring approach with the industry and our model to determine the level of liability insurance coverage. As illustrated in Schedule 4 of the Act that I explained a little bit earlier and that came into effect in 2016, there are four levels of liability insurance, depending on the volume of dangerous good and crude oil. We have also implemented an annual verification cycle whereby each railway needs to confirm that they are in compliance with the requirements of the Act, disclose any changes to their operations or liability insurance, provide the insurance policy numbers as renewed with the insurer, and confirm the level of self-insurance. They also provide us with an updated annual volume of dangerous goods transported, which we verify against the four tiers of the Schedule 4. The railway industry have adopted well to this new regime and our annual compliance monitoring is run, running smoothly as they're familiar with our expectations and we act proactively to remind them of their annual submissions with us, usually about one month prior to the deadline. Uh, there were some challenges at the beginning for the railway industry and the insurance marketplace to adjust to the four level system of liability insurance coverage and our annual oversight cycle. That being said, these challenges have been addressed in the annual certificate of insurance and certificate of compliance submitted by the railway companies confirm that the requirements of the acts are met. There's one further element I would like to add, Dan, if you, if you allow me to. Certainly. Uh, I'd like to mention that in 2020, uh, through a later decision issued by the agency, all certificates of fitness for freight railways have been reissued to specify the volume of prescribed goods the railway company is authorized to carry in a calendar year, as defined in Schedule 4. So essentially, what we did in 2020, we hard-coded in the certificate of fitness which level you were in, in terms of the volume of crude oil or uh, toxic inhalation hazards or other dangerous goods. This reinforces our oversight regime and if the railways want to move from one tier to the other, they have to go to the agency and request for variance to their certificate of fitness. Uh, Donald, if I can go back to you, how would these changes affect local government and the general public in the event of another major accident? Well, uh, thanks, Dan. The review of the regime rapidly focused on the existing uh, marine liability uh, a regime who got a positive track record by having dedicated fund for dedicated type of incident. So we could see with the work of the of the CTA that now there's a lot more monitoring of how much volumes are also are carried on a yearly basis. So also the broad scope of uh, the type of claim the fund covered both during the event and afterward changed significantly the rapid access of funds. Uh, from the political realm to the administrative process, improving uh, a lot the, the way the regime uh, responds to uh, local communities, public, and uh, also the multiple jurisdiction involved. Andy, how have railway companies adjusted to the resulting changes? The railways have met the insurance standards that are required by the CTA and continue to maintain an effective dialogue with all, all the regulators, including Transport Canada. Transport Canada has introduced uh, various protective directions to the railway industry. 
And I'll give you one example, and that's PD 36, which requires the railways to disclose dangerous goods shipments being transported through communities across Canada. Okay, so to transport crude oil, railway companies relied on the Class 111 or DOT 111 tank cars, the cars that were involved in the lac Meganic derailment. Are the DOT 111 tank cars still allowed to transport crude oil? No, not anymore. The 111 tank cars are, are prohibited to transport flammable liquids. Flammable liquids, including crude oil, must now be transported in, in the specification, the DOT TC 117 tank car, and that is now mandated by regulation. So a new tank car, the TC-117, uh, my understanding was unveiled in 2015. What are the main differences between the 111 and the newer 117 tank cars? Well, the main differences between the 111 tank car and the 117 tank include, uh, for example, the tank shell thickness has increased from 7 sixteenths in the 111 cars to 9 sixteenths of an inch thick. Uh, the tank shell itself is covered by jacketed thermal protection, and that's designed to protect the tank shell itself from flame impingement. Um, at the ends of the cars, there's full height uh, tank end head shields, and these are half inch thick. Uh, at the top, there's a top valve rollover protection, and down on the bottom, at the bottom outlet valve, the handles are removable, so they will not uh, operate accidentally in the event of an accident. Are there any other requirements to improve safety that you would like to add? Well, one of the recommendations from uh, the consultations at the Emergency Response Task Force was adding flammable liquids, including crude oil, to uh, reg uh, TDG regulations part seven under emergency response assistance plans. Now this regulatory requirement, which now has been accepted and implemented, means that the shipper of crude oil must have an approved response plan to deal with an incident involving this product in any jurisdiction in Canada that it will be transported. Uh, this is designed to assist local first responders. Uh, Donald, do you have something to add? Uh, yes, we can certainly add that uh, the enshrined review at, the, uh, at specific time of the different act and their regulations, so those clauses uh, make it mandatory to government in place to trigger, trigger them at regular interval. So avoiding obsolescence of different suite of protections uh, the new regime offered. So this is a plus uh, in, in all those different acts that's been okay. put in place. I'd like to discuss the collection of the new levy, if we may. So in 2016, the fund was created and started to receive what we call a levy from the railway companies transporting crude oil. Donald, can you explain what a levy is and why it was introduced at the time? Uh, yes, a levy is the simplest way. It's based on user pay principle. It is based on the volume of specific product carried out and go to a specific fund for specific purposes. And of course, in our case, damages that can be caused by the carriage of oil by rail. So does the levy protect Canadians from bearing the costs of damages in the event of an accident? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, so we, we've read that first responders for a time were responding to lack mechanic fire and spill without pay due to compensation issues, and that people who suffer damages and families of victims received mixed messages on where to turn to to be compensated. We also heard that the Council of Lac Meganic needed money quickly to decontaminate and rebuild a devastated downtown area. Do you think the creation of the fund is the right way to prevent similar issues in the event of another major accident? Uh, it is a proven regime for decades in the maritime sectors. So it's definitely an added asset in the overall toolkit to protect and compensate the general public and individual in case of accident. We've touched on the changes made to the Canada Transportation Act, requiring transparency within the railway industry to adopt safer ways to transport dangerous goods increased insurance requirements based on risk, the creation of the fund, as well as new enforcement mechanisms and punitive sanctions. Luke, is there more that should be considered? I think the actual regime is good, uh, Dan. Uh, it's been well implemented with different level of oversight and monitoring on the part of federal agencies, as we explained today. 
That being said, we need to maintain situational awareness regarding rail movements of dangerous goods and be vigilant regarding potential changes to the risk environment that might require adjustments on the part of the industry or on the part of ourselves. So Donald, the uh, transport minister may designate other dangerous goods to be covered by the fund after an accident. Were other products considered? Uh, well, we certainly uh, see other product emerging in the future due to the uh, uh, energy transitions uh, that uh, we will be facing in our collective uh, net zero target in 2050. So the legislative regime uh, should be able to accommodate those new needs of coverage and protections. Did you look at other jurisdictions for best practices? Uh, we definitely look at the USA regime and the European regimes, uh, mainly following uh, big accidents in the USA. Uh, however, our best example was just before our own eyes in the, in the form of the marine liability regime. So it's became obvious to simply enhance and adjust the existing regime and allow it to take it to fulfill its missions of responses to compensations and liability in Canada. In the event of a major accident, the fund could compensate for loss of non-use value related to a public resource, as well as loss of hunting, fishing, and gathering opportunities by Indigenous persons. Can you give examples of what this means and what these losses could look like? Uh, those elements of losses of non-use uh, non value are extremely important, in particular for local community. Luke mentioned at the beginning uh, water, potable water. Uh, we have also either coastal or land uh, uh, located habitat. The loss of those habitat, for example, can have significant impact on hunters and gatherers. Uh, this is certainly for our First Nations and other uh, individuals who are practicing these, uh, these activities, both at the commercial level or from a traditional survival way of life. So in addition, uh, deteriorations or the destructions of specific site uh, in the tourist sector, for example, can have significant impact. So let's move on to rail traffic trends and their effects on some rail safety in Canada. Crude by rail numbers have been volatile in the past few years, but shipments reached a record 412,000 barrels per day in February 2020, for example. Andy, as shipment volumes increase, could it also increase the risk of derailments and accidents? Well, just like when we drive our car to the store, there's always a risk. When, uh, whenever we switch out a shipper siding or build trains in our rail yard, or even move full trains on our mainline track, there's always a risk of accident. Our job as safety committed railways is to reduce that risk through research, technology, education, training, and communication. We never stop and say mission accomplished. We're relentless in striving to ensure our rail companies are safe. And in fact, 99.9% .9 of all dangerous goods shipments arrive at destination incident free. Luke, are there other dangerous goods trends you and your organization have been monitoring? Dan, as part of the annual certificate of compliance to be filled by all federal regulated railways, we monitor the volume of toxic inhalation hazards, crude oil, and other dangerous goods. Those are the three categories that we systematically monitor, and it's in alignment with the Schedule 4 of the Canada Transportation Act. Andy, uh, what other improvements is the rail industry implementing to enhance safety in the movement of dangerous goods? Well, the railway industry is driven to ensure the care and maintenance of our equipment. Uh, we make sure that our track structure integrity is always maintained throughout the year. Uh, we inspect performance and train our employees, contractors and shippers to ensure all human factors are taken into account when dealing with operational safety. And as I mentioned before, this practice is ongoing. So gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, but before we end our session, are there any last words? Uh, thank you again for the fun, for this great opportunity to go back in time. Uh, I, our thought always continue to be with the family and the people who have been affected by this very, very uh, special uh, accident. And uh, we hope that our continuous effort uh, will bring fruition and uh, take us to uh, close to net zero on, on accident.
Well, thank you everyone. Thank you for your participation and for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with our expert guests. For any questions or comments that you might have, please reach us by email below. If you'd like to stay up to date on any fun news, events, or current opportunities, please sign up for our newsletter at the link below as well. And if you have any questions for any of the other organizations, we invite you to use their general contact information, which we've included below. We also invite you to join us for our next episode, where we answer all the questions you might have about the fund. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you next time.